Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tunnel My Players. This is Assassin's Creed Origins. We're going to be playing the Discovery Tour. It just came out today, tonight, here in Australia. Um, and we're going to play it. <clears throat> I really haven't looked much into it. Obviously, we know it's the educational side, um, where there's a bunch of tours. I think it's something along the lines of like 75 historical accurate tours that teach us about ancient Egypt and everything in the game. So, without further ado, we're going to get straight into it. Is that it? Have I done it? Yep. Oh, it's loading. Okay. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, let's do this. The Discovery Tour. I'm very excited. I wasn't sure about playing this, but then someone pointed out on Twitter, there's achievements. So, simply do not have a choice, but we're going to figure this out. We're going to have some fun. I want to see how it kind of starts up and introduces us to everything. Um... And you know, while we're here, we might just try to get all the achievements while we're here. I'm not sure how long it will take to get all the achievements, but we'll see. And for the love of God, please don't make me go to all 75 tours and listen to 75 different lectures, because that's simply too much. Save me. Oh, but we get to pick what character we run around as, don't we? I'm actually pretty excited for that. Here's me, just picks Bayek, just because I don't actually want to play as anybody else. With content curated by Egyptologists and hundreds of images sourced from museums and libraries around the world, we hope to share with you the passion that inhabited us for the four years it took to develop Assassin's Creed Origins. No, that's cute. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here we go. Welcome to Discovery Tour. The Discovery by Assassin's Tour. Creed, Ancient Egypt. Carter Tours will take you through majestic landmarks and uh, acquaint you with Egypt, uh, with ancient Egyptians and their culture. I can read. Enjoy the vast panoramas of this beautiful country through the eyes of an eagle. Use the avatar to climb to the very top of the Great Pyramid. Okay. Navigate a boat along the banks of the River Nile or ride a horse across deserts and lush fertile lands. I guess this is, has to be their sort of worded introductions for, like, schools and shit that would be using this mode, right? We hope you enjoyed this experience. Man, I'd be jacked if I was in high school and my teacher rolls up Assassin's Creed Origins in history class. I would have lost my shit, especially because I did modern history. That would have definitely been confusing. Who am I playing as? So, why would I be Aya first? Explain to me why I would be Aya first. Someone explain that to me. I literally... Why is Senu with her? I literally just released a video this week on why she sucks in this game. Not Though I don't hate Aya. But I definitely don't want to play as Aya. Can I change... Can I change characters? I can. So we got Bayek, Julius Caesar, Cleopatra. Fuck off, bitch. William Miles! Oh my god, it's going to be tough to beat playing as William Miles... Uh, Hemu. <gasps> Shadja! Redda. Oh, that merchant kid. Actor. Let's go through this. Uh, bike with the... J oh, this is bike with all these different outfits. Oh, that's all? Okay, I guess so. Um, we're totally playing as William Miles. This is going to be fucking hilarious. Because think of the memes, guys. Think of the memes. Oh my god, we're playing as William Miles. <laughs> oh, this is so fucking stupid. Okay, let's start. Alexandria planning of the city. Number of stations, eight. Learn about the design layout of the city of Alexandria. Estimated time, six minutes. Let's start the tour, ladies and gentlemen. Let's do this. Welcome to Alexandria. Follow the trail. Oh. The it's a narrator, that's cute. Alexander's plan to build his great city began with a verse from Homer's Odyssey. There is, in front of Egypt, in the sea with many swells, an island called Pharos. Guided by these clues, Alexander the Great founded his future city at the western end of the Nile Delta. Okay, is that it? Do I keep... Do I keep moving? I 
Oh, I click on it. Okay, that's a picture of Alexander the Great, I guess. Oh, I press B to exit, and then we keep following the trail. Oh my god, we're William Miles. That's ringing a couple of one-two bells right now. Though Alexander considered this location ideal for his great city, it presented considerable challenges. Too difficult to access during storms, the surrounding swamps threatened disease, and the limestone soil prevented the growth of healthy crops. However, due to the influence of his mentor Aristotle, Alexander the Great recognized that the true value was its strategic emplacement. Alexander knew that in controlling Pelusium to the east, Memphis to the south, and his crowning glory Alexandria to the west, he would create a triangular stronghold, allowing him to control the entire delta while giving him access to the Mediterranean. Well, Alexander was a smart, smart cookie. Does William Miles have a flask on the back of his pocket? The fucking alcoholic? Why is he good? No weapons, no hidden blade, but a fucking flask. Because he's a fucking alcoholic. Sorry, back to the education. Alexandria had a humble beginning. Lacking chalk to outline the future city's foundations, architects were forced to use flour instead. Clouds of migrating birds swept down and ate the flower, erasing the plans. This prompted Alexander to seek guidance from the oracles, who reassured him that his future city was destined to feed a large population. The oracles, of course. Well, I mean, I guess it kind of works out, right? Excavations led by Mahmud Bey al-Falaki in the 19th century revealed that the wall enclosure measured approximately 5.2 kilometers in length and 2.2 kilometers in width. It was roughly 9 meters in height. Huh. Okay then. Let's keep moving, William. These formidable ancient walls would resist a number of attacks, including fending off the king of Syria in 169 BCE. It wasn't until 295 CE that they eventually fell to Roman Emperor Diocletian, and this only after eight months of relentless assault. Let's have a look at this. Hmm. I like that each thing has like an extra little element to it that's actually the real shit, like real paintings, old paintings or artifacts or things like that. <clears throat> okay, let's keep this moving. This one's a bit further away than usual. I'm seriously, I'm just thinking back, you know, being in high school and doing history class. This would, like, holy shit, this would be the greatest shit of all time. This is like your assignment? This is how you study? Could you imagine? Fuck off. Dinocrates chose a Hippodamian grid plan. The grid maximized functionality with wide straight roads and canals running beneath them. Alexander recognized the military value of the city's design. The wide parallel streets gave him optimal surveillance of the city while allowing the unobstructed flow of troops. Well, I like that. I love civil engineering. I tell you what, my grandfather was a civil engineer, he used to travel around the world to all these ancient sites to learn shit. I might have actually been able to get him to play video games once if I showed him this. The corridor ran from the Mediterranean's north port down to Lake Mariotis to the south. This thoroughfare acted as an unobstructed link for commercial trade and travel between the two ports. Many of the streets were bordered with grand buildings and parks including Canopic Street, with its impressive gate bordering the eastern end. Well, Alexandria is clearly bigger in real life than uh, the game. Um, but, I mean, that's pretty obvious. We already knew that. And here we finish the tour. Alexandria was most likely built upon an already existing Egyptian village. Upon its completion, the Egyptians reviled the city, 
refusing to call it by its founder's name. Instead, they called it Raqqed, the building, as a mark of disdain, which was later Hellenized into Rakotis. Despite this, the name Alexandria would remain. You goddamn right it did. We've completed a tour, guys! <gasps> Achievement! First visit, fuck yeah, fuck oath. Welcome to Discovery Tour by Assassin's Creed. You can now explore ancient Egypt at your own pace or select start to use your new tool by opening the pause menu. Oh, they want us to actually open the pause menu. Okay, so they got all the tours here. Ready to go. Love it. Egypt, pyramids, Alexandria, daily life. Roman. Do we unlock more characters with this? No, all the same. Passport. Okay, it's just a different way to do it. Timeline. Oh, there's a timeline of Egypt. Yeah, cool. Uh, country. Yeah, okay, cool. And just, there's our map. It's got all the tools on it. I want to check what achievements we need first, and we'll work towards that. Because you know me. Achievements. <clears throat> okay, so there's only three achievements. We got the first one already. Um, that were in this thing. Complete all tours in daily life category. There's 20 there. Okay. Uh, complete f tours with at least five different characters. Easy to do. Let's start with that. And let's at least start doing some of those daily life ones. I wouldn't mind exploring. Exploring that. I guess we've got to find categories. Do they tell us the categories? Here, oh, that's Alexandria. Ancient Egyptian cultivation. I assume that's daily life. Tours. Let's check daily life. Because I want to actually walk to them. I don't want to just, you know, be fast traveling to tours and shit. I, I want to run around as these characters. You can ride horses, so. Um, let's do, start with a short one. Oil of Ancient Egypt. View station. Let's. Can, can't we just mark them? On the map? Oh, but I guess we gotta go to the map. I guess they'd be the ones that are nowhere near anything. Ancient Egypt, Egyptian fashion. Temples and rituals of ancient Egypt. The importance of mummies. I guess we could do that. So we'll do five tours. Guys, I think in this time I play, at least get one more achievement. <clears throat> As five different characters. We've played William Miles. Oh, yeah, we can't call the horse. Holy fuck. Holy shit, William Miles is riding a horse. Guys, William Miles is riding a horse. Holy shit. I don't think you guys understand what's happening right now. I don't think you guys understand the awesomeness of what's happening right now. We have William Miles in ancient Egypt, who's not really William Miles because he's a different voice actor and he's not ringing any bells, who's on a horse in the desert in 49 BC. I can't explain to you how fucked up this is to me right now. Okay, we're almost here. Let's let's go pick another character then. For this for this guided tour. What do we want? Let's go. Hemu. Look at him! Look at him! He's so fast, the little rascal! Look at him! Wow, he has his own animations and everything. Strolling about Hemu. Okay. Understanding the importance of mummies oh, for ancient Egypt. Like ancient Egypt. Shut up, dude. Welcome to the importance of mummies. You've got to learn, young Hemu, about your people. The first hieroglyph for embalmer appeared in pyramid texts of the Old Kingdom. It is likely that embalming was a trade that progressed alongside the evolution of ancient Egyptian funeral practices. While we still know nothing of how embalming came to be a profession, we do know that embalmers had a hierarchy, and that each embalmer specialized in a specific phase of the mummification process. That is pretty fucked, when you think about it. Like, when you think of the question, how did that even become a thing people did? One serial killer is just like murdering people? 
and just so, obsessed with like wrapping him up and like keeping him in his closet. And they explain to some people like, what the fuck? It's like, no, it's really good. Like preserving them. It's a ritual thing. They're like, oh, okay. And that's becomes like a trade people do for life. What a fucked up thing the to decide to do. Techniques were jealously guarded by embalmers from generation to generation. Despite their efforts, Herodotus and Diodorus discovered their methods in late antiquity, but historians were skeptical about the validity of the texts. It remained a mystery until two teams of modern medical legal scientists confirmed the process in 1994 and again in 2011. The Uabet, meaning the pure place, was where the embalmers mummified the bodies of the deceased. Until the end of the Middle Kingdom, it was located in badge. tents at the edges of the city due to the smell of decomposition. In the New Kingdom, however, the Uabet was located within the city limits, though still in open air spaces. In the same way that the practices and techniques of mummification evolved, so possibly did consideration towards embalmers within ancient Egyptian society. Why oh, is that salt shit? The pharaoh had access to the most elaborate of mummification rituals. Oh, Jesus Christ! The citizens of Egypt also enjoyed complex embalming options, though none of them allowed for the removal of the brain or viscera. After purifying the body, embalmers injected a liquid through the rectum, sealed it, <laughs> and allowed the rectum. mixture to settle. I don't just have to play this. <laughs> plunged the body into natron for up to 40 days. Once the body was dried, the seal was removed, and the entrails flowed out with the injected liquid, leaving the skin and bones of the deceased to be wrapped in linen and returned to the family for burial. Yeah, so this is the salt stuff. The least costly embalming option was for the embalmers to simply inject a product called Sermaya and immerse the body in the natron for up to 40 days before handing it over to the family. Jesus Christ. For all those who could not afford any embalming process, desert burials offered a pauper's alternative to preserve the bodies of the dead. Righto. Let's throw them in the sand, I guess. Sounds like a culture of... Hiding bodies. Egyptian civilization has always appealed to Westerners, even before the Greek and Roman invasions. As early as the Middle Ages, mummies discovered by travelers were often sent back to Europe. Curio cabinets, dating from the 16th and 17th centuries, usually included pharaonic artifacts in their collections. The Egyptomania phenomenon was heralded by Napoleon Bonaparte's Egyptian campaign, which lasted from 1798 to 1802. The following years were marked by a resurgence of interest from rich enthusiasts and scholars who exposed Egypt to the general populace. Many research societies focusing on Egyptology were founded during those years. By 1868, mass tourism began in Egypt, under the aegis of the Cook Agency. The rich would indulge in leisure trips to Egypt and bring back mummies. Upon their return, they would organize evenings that consisted of unpacking mummies and removing strips of linen and amulets layer by layer. What the These fuck? These were considered the shining cultural events of the season. The Egyptian collections of many a museum were founded as a consequence of this mass pillaging. Whoa, that's fucked. Like rich people in the late 1800s are like, yeah, let's have a party. Uh, what are we doing? Oh, I don't know. We're just gonna like dig up some old ancient fucking bodies because we're normal and definitely not psychopaths and shit. Jesus Christ. Thanks to those dubious parties, the fantasy of a mummy coming back to life seeking revenge on its defilers was born. The mummy malediction myth has remained steady in popular culture ever since, particularly in written media and cinema. 
<clears throat> Take your time. I'll wait. It's not like ancient Egypt is going anywhere. Oh god, those voices are gonna be all over the place, aren't they, with this shit? That was a pretty cool tour, you know? I mean, I, I mean, I don't know a lot about ancient Egypt, to be honest. I'm not an expert, so... This, for me, actually is gonna be pretty interesting. Though, I'm, I'm almost certain I'm not gonna do all, like, 75 of these tours, but, you know, I'll give them all a bit of a crack. I'll give... I'll be a bit diverse. Is it a bit fucked up that I'm gonna play as the little girl Shadia in Fayoum, uh, hometown where she fucking died? Yes, it is, Tyler, but you know what? Here we are, gonna do another tour. But, like I said, we're gonna, before we finish up this video, we're gonna do that achievement for, uh, doing five tours with five different characters. So, we've been Chemu, William Miles, and now Shadia, who's just running around like a little assassin, which is sick. We're going to do a tour, ladies and gentlemen, on domesticated animals of ancient Egypt because I like animals. Except cats, they fucking suck. Um, Alright, where's this tour at? Oh, right here. There it is. Oh, there's cats here. Let's start the tour. Welcome to Domesticated Animals of Ancient Egypt. we got another voice now this time. A lady! Agriculture and domesticated livestock were introduced 6,000 years ago. Archaeologists have found traces of cattle, donkeys, pigs, and dogs. Dromedary are thought to have been introduced during the Persian invasion. Well, I guess humans have always liked to have pets, right? Take that, vegans. Wait, is that a ticket vegans? I don't know. Pets were deeply cherished in ancient Egypt. Many illustrations of children often include a pet in the depiction. There's so many animals around here. I do wonder, was it... Oh, I mean, it's definitely... I was about to say, is it like this in the actual game? Are there all the animals out here? There's definitely not. Even just looking at them, they're all set up perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. A stupid tell you're an idiot. One of ancient Egypt's most iconic animals, the cat, wasn't adopted into their daily life until the Middle Kingdom. Since they were so highly capable of killing snakes and rodents, cats were present throughout every period. However, they only became pets sometime during the Middle Kingdom. Prince Thutmosa, son of Amenhotep III, had his cat Tamu laid to rest in its own sarcophagi. Oh my god, what? Because they killed snakes and shit. Fucking, I can kill a snake and shit. I had a dog that did that. Fuck off. Cats are shit. They're shit animals. And I'm allergic to them too. Chickens! I just want to kick and be like Fable. Chicken chaser! <laughs> no one even understands that reference. The earliest reference to dogs. Hey dog, your dicks are, Why did you have a dick coming out of your nipples? They were popular pets, as they helped hunters and protected herds. They were closely linked to Anubis, the jackal-headed god. Baboons, monkeys, and even falcons were tamed as pets. Each was mummified and buried with as much ceremony as any family member. That's damn right. Fuck yeah, dogs are sick. Love me some dogs. Bullshit, Shadia. Bullshit, if you can land this, you're sick. That is so fucking weird. That's so wrong. Children should not be able to do this. I mean, Kemu couldn't, fucking stupid kid. Who could we be now? <laughs> Let's be Julius Caesar. We are now in Siwa, ladies and gentlemen. That's right, Siwa. And we're gonna be Julius Caesar in Siwa. I don't, I'm trying to, it was almost like they rhyme, but it doesn't. I was just saying it like they rhymed. So, I sound real stupid now. We're gonna do a tour that's about the first mummy, Osiris. 
So let's do it. Welcome to Osiris, the first mummy. I want to know about this. The oldest mummies recovered date from the Old Kingdom, though Egyptologists believe that mummification was in use much earlier than that. Where do you see that photo? At first, the body was mummified through environmental desiccation by leveraging the dryness of the environment and the heat of the climate. Early experimentations in mummification were conducted with the use of resin made from tree sap. Strips of linen were only used on some superficial parts of the epidermis of the hands or jaw. Alrighty then. Too much information. Ideologically, the will to preserve the body is not explained in any way until 3600 BCE. This is when the Egyptian belief that the body Fuck housed that. the soul was finally documented for modern Egyptologists to eventually decipher. It was not until the arrival of the myth of Osiris in the Egyptian religion around the 5th dynasty that mummification was thoroughly conceptualized. The practice was thereafter grounded in both a mythological and ideological point of view. Huh, okay. Osiris was mainly known as the god of the dead and the god of resurrection. The most well-known Genesis myth concerning Osiris is that of his dismemberment. What, like cutting off the parts of his body? Or, I guess. It is Plutarch who gives the most simplified and complete summary of the story. Within Egyptian mythology, Osiris represented the first king to rule Egypt. Jealous of his power, his brother Seth attempted to usurp his throne. After several unsuccessful attempts, Seth succeeded in killing his brother by dismembering him and scattering the pieces of his body all over Egypt. Holy shit. Iset, the great of magic, traveled all over Egypt in search of the pieces of her husband's body. After a long search, she recovered all the pieces save for his manhood, as it was eaten by a fish. What the fuck? Tell you what, this case, in everywhere possible, bros definitely didn't come before hers. Bros killed you before hers, and then the wife came, literally found every piece of his body, except the one she wanted. No, this is a bad. That was a bad joke. That because you couldn't find the dick and stuff. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was bad taste. I'm sorry. It's my bad. We all know it's bad. Yeah, that's pretty funny though. Iset then reassembled the body of her husband by binding it together with strips of linen. Aided by her sister Nephthys, another powerful magician. They gave Osiris the breath of life. This not only brought him back from the dead, but also allowed him to recover his virility long enough to impregnate Iset, thus ensuring his succession before, once more, dying. Thus Horus was born. Wait, so even, even without his dick, this magician gave Osiris life? Oh! Allowed him to recover his virility. So he was able to recover his dick long enough. The to ritual used to, to bring fuck. Osiris back to life Respect. essentially depicts how he became the first mummy. It is why, on the sarcophagi of kings, we often find Iset and Nephthys represented as the magicians who restore life to the deceased. Wow. First thing this dude did when he was revived from life was fuck. That is legendary. That's a guy I can get behind right there. That's fucking sick. <laughs> that is hilarious. Okay, so we're going to finish this video and this little achievement to do five tours of five different characters as the little golem little pharaoh thing that Ptolemy dude. Really looks like golem. In a pharaoh outfit. Alrighty. Let's. Uh, 
the ferret just shows up at a marketplace. It's like, I just want to come here and learn about the people. The Egyptian household. Welcome to the Egyptian household. In pre-Greco-Roman culture, women were considered equal to men in many matters. They owned property, testified in court, could divorce and inherit. Until the Greeks and Romans restricted their rights, Egyptian women could take over their deceased husband's trade. Marriage contracts included mentions of allowances and items of value brought to the marriage by the woman, which would forever belong to her. Equality? Ugh, yuck. No, I'm just joking. Joke! It's a joke, guys! It's a joke. I'm joking. That's what James would say, right? Certain professions were open only to women, such as weaving or professional mourning, while others were available to both genders, including working as servants for the rich households. Social status did have an impact, though. The higher in status, the easier it was to obtain education and access different professions. So that lady have four tits? Or are those just fat flaps or something? I don't know. I mean, big bone flaps. I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I don't, also don't care. Um. Homes were generally composed of three rooms. First, there was the entrance, furnished with a small bench of brick, probably intended for a statue and protective divinity. Then there was the ceremonial room, meant to receive guests. The last room was either a bedroom or kitchen. Furniture consisted of basic what do you mean, chairs, or kitchen? chests, and storage. Can I both? were not used for family dinners. Instead, each individual had a small table of their own. Okay, so if they had a kitchen and no bedroom, where did they sleep? Marriages were a social contract rather than a religious construct. Family was vitally important to ancient Egyptians, and children were considered a blessing from the gods. The father, mother, and their children were the nucleus of the family, and cohabitation sometimes extended to mothers-in-law, sisters, aunts, and sisters-in-law. Oh God, the in-laws are coming in. Or in this case, the pharaoh of Egypt is walking in your house and like, oh, what's up? I'm just learning. Don't mind me. Status and wealth played a large role in the style and size of ancient Egyptian homes. Commoners' houses were built with sun-baked mud bricks. Wealthier homes were often painted in white and decorated with various motifs. Only temples and tombs meant to last for all eternity were built with stone. Oh wow, okay. So the temples were meant to last forever. The houses were not. Funeral stone inscriptions focused on the main member of a household. Encircling this person would then be a spouse, parents and children, possibly even siblings. These stones were so structured because there were no surnames in ancient Egyptian culture. Parents and children were a sort of family tree, which allowed for the identification of the deceased. Well, that's actually pretty interesting. Other than me ruining it with just pure blasphemy. And there's the achievement! Complete tools with at least five different characters. Fucking done ya. Get the fuck out of here. One achievement to go, which I'll do... In my private time, I won't bore you with another 15 Egyptian lifestyle tours. Not bore you, what am I talking about? These are just super interesting. Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, that's the discovery tour. Very well done. I find it very interesting. Learn a bit, hope you learn a bit. Uh, very well done by Ubisoft to put that together, and I apologize for uh, tarnishing it with me, you know, talking. So, uh, anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Time of my plays. I'll see you Tuesday for another Assassin's Creed video. And tomorrow, if you're a patreon.com slash as always, we're the Kill Kind of Clubhouse. And I'll see you fucking later.